my name's Helen Lentil. I'm the Fellow in Distance Learning at the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom. I'm here today in Vancouver, Canada at the Commonwealth of Learning and we're working together on a project on leadership and management in distance learning. I'm delighted to be joined by Margaret Hawhey, who is the Vice President Academic at Athabasca University in Canada. Margaret, can you tell us actually what do you do? Well, I do quite a variety of things. Um, I'm responsible for ensuring that the completion of the academic plan and its realization. I'm responsible for making sure that we actually envisage and complete the research mandate of the university. I have a portfolio in innovation. I'm responsible for the budget of the university in relation to all of those areas. It's about 80% of the total budget. I work closely with IT and IT services. I have responsibility for all of the collaborations that happen nationally and I deal with international affairs. And I'm responsible for government relations and negotiate with government on programs and so on. So quite a range. So what's the difference between that and what would happen in a conventional face-to-face -face university? You would see no students at Athabasca University, so that means I have no classroom facilities, no restaurants, no residences. But even though they're not visible, they are very much at the centre of what we do. You would probably notice that we have a distributed faculty, so the faculty work for home offices rather than working from um, space in a, in a residential unit. Um, you could also say that um, the relationship that we have in terms of working across IT and the importance of the IT infrastructure is something that's different for us. Um, there are a variety of things that one could add to that to talk about things that are there. Perhaps one of the most common ones is the centralization of activities and the importance of that is probably a reflection of the university's values. So how does that look in practice? You can look at where all of our student services are, everywhere from the registrarial function all the way through to customer relationship development and how that functions within the university. You would look at course design and development. You would look at um, all of the functions that are associated with materials management. So all of the functions that are associated with students, enrollment would be another one that's centralized. So as you look at it, recruitment, enrollment, the course and program program development themselves, their offerings, so the allocation of tutors and all of that is centralized in a large way. You're really saying the major function of this university is around its students and that's very evident in what is centralized. Margaret, you have a background in education policy and administration. Why is it so important for distance learning to have clear policies and robust administration? Well, every university needs this, not just distance education universities. Um, when I think about policies, I think about them as the embodiment of principles and processes that act as foundational for the way that the work of the university operates. And within principles, I would be thinking about things like respect, I inclusiveness, um, appeals as some of the aspects that should be built into policies and that can frame policies in that way. When you have policies in place, they enable the institution to know its values and to know what the appropriate ways of dealing with issues and people are. In terms of administration, I think about administration in st structures and processes that you put in place that linked to policies are often the procedures that, that are attached to a policy, but are also there are administrative processes that are there as well. They're, they help people know how things are to happen in an organization and in an IT world where everybody thinks they 
should just email the president. They provide some guidance as to who it is that's responsible and who should get what next and how that works. I think they're a, they're a way of engaging people in the work of the organization and they're very important to ensure that they don't stretch too far. What's the role of, of the distance learning university leadership in ensuring these? Hmm. Well, you set them, you have to reset them, you have to review them, and you have to always be looking at reduction because one of the tendencies, as I indicated uh, to you, is that these have, uh, these have a growth factor if you're not very careful about them. And so what we do is our policies are reviewed annually, it's meant to be annually for most of them. And that's a very quick look to say, is there, are the procedures working here? Or should we be adding something else? Or indeed, is this too cumbersome? Should we be reducing something else? I think administrative processes probably don't get the same amount of attention um, unless something falls apart. But I think about administrative processes as allowing a space for mentoring, which is something that I think is also important in the whole way of looking at administration. And it's something that leaders have to pay particular attention to, to make sure that not that there's a succession planning of one, but really that everybody understands how to do the next level work, as it were. You are known as an active researcher in distance learning. Mm -hmm. Is research important to leadership in distance learning? And if so, how? Mm. Is research important? Very hard to get by without it, I would think. Um, when I look at this, the question, for me, research is broader than just academic research. So academic research in and of itself is important, but it often looks at just small components of it. The research that deals with academic leadership and management in distance education institutions is a, a, a lot fewer, I think, in terms of the amount of material that's out there. And in the work itself, the academic part is only one part of that story. You really need a lot of business intelligence that's much broader. You need work on demographics, you need environmental scans, you need to read government reports, you need to look at what other organizations that are interested in e-learning in some form have published. And, and then all of that has to be analyzed and put through the, the grid in order to say to yourself, so what's here? How does this help our strategies? Often what you're doing is picking up trends. You're looking at things and saying, there's an interesting thing that a peer is doing now, and it may well be a residential peer, but it helps you see where they're starting to move. And as always on a field, you're, somebody moves, everybody else jockeys for a different, slightly different position. So as you go in through that kind of process, um, it also helps solidify for you what's important in a strategy. It can contribute to arguments as to why something is important. And it can just be good w advice and good, well, things change in language, which is another piece. When you're doing this kind of work, you always have to have current language and you need to look at all of that kind of work to do that. So research in all its forms is really important to this role. Can, can you expand a bit more on that, about institutional research and how it's important? It's essential. It's essential because otherwise you're, being, you're steering yourself entirely by what's happening outside the organization. So while I talked about research in that sense of getting external reviews to be able to position yourself, you have to be constantly doing the research on the other side. So we, we publish every month reviews that look at student, student growth, student numbers. We look at student satisfaction data every year. We participate in national studies on student satisfaction, both done externally by the province and run across all of the universities in Canada that wish to participate. We try to gear looking at particular kinds of areas and we're moving more and more into learning analytics, into that analysis which says uh, student 
students? What exactly are the behaviors that help us identify at-risk students? How can we better ensure the students um, have success in their studies? Because that's, of course, a major component of our belief system. Margaret, we're in a very rapidly changing field. How do you personally keep up to date with the issues and debates in our field? With difficulty, I suppose, but there's a whole variety of ways that one does it. Um, I have um, a person who scans all of the external materials for me, and that includes journals, and identifies what are the topics that come, and then I'll go back and take a look at what are issues in that? I want to read more deeply. Are we looking at a flavor of the month? Is this something that has a tune to it? I still have had a number of doctoral students while I've been in this role, and they've been in distance education, and so that's always been a kind of a part of the story as well. Um, after network theory actually can play a part in distance learning, so you, it, there are all kinds of things. Um, the faculty themselves will engage you and say, this is happening, what do you think? Should we be doing something? It's quite common to get emails like that. Um, and as well as that, I work closely with um, the um, associate AVPA whose role is in learning resources and who is also the director of the Centre for Learning Design and Development. And we have many ongoing discussions because right now we're rewriting policy around course development. And so you're constantly, no matter what you're doing and when you're looking at improving things, the question is always, is what we're doing good enough? What's out there that might help us improve? And that, that means somebody has to go and find research and take a look at it. So you're always using it just in that way. So it's not that I have to do it myself, but it's, an, it's a question that we ask ourselves always, which is, what are other people doing? What's happening around these kinds of things? Are we in the forefront or are we a little behind? And sometimes that's a good place to be. What advice would you give to institutional leaders who are working in organisations that don't currently do distance learning on implementing distance learning and sustainable distance learning? Well, first of all, you need a very clear vision and you need to translate that vision into goals. You need to remember to be flexible around the realisation of those and those goals should be realisable. But be flexible about them and recognize that you've got to adapt in, in that process. You need to have a business plan and you need to include when you're doing your budgeting indirect as well as direct costs because there's a lot more to this than is at the surface change. You need to take into account infrastructure needs. So all of those surround a big question around how good are you at change management and what exactly is the culture of your institution? Because in the end, those two things will actually determine whether you're successful or not. Can you elaborate a bit more on what you mean by organizational culture? Every organization has things that are very important to it and that the, um, that the people in the organization basically embody in the way that they value certain things and in the way their work processes work. So if I'm a residential institution and I value interaction, for example, I value engagement with students, then distance education with the idea, especially where we're not dealing with video and we're doing it online, has a remoteness for many, for many faculty members and the kind of buzz that they get from students who come up and say, oh, I'd like to talk to you about this and have you seen this and last night I was thinking about what you said and suddenly all of that doesn't quite work the same way in this much more um, patterned way of, of discourse that you see in an online forum unless you have a really unusual group. So that that is always there for people when they make that kind of piece. Is it important for your culture? So that's only a very small part of it. But then as well as that, we're starting to say that 
this is not about your teaching, but it's about their learning. And your culture may well already have espoused that, and that may be well embedded. But if it's not, then that's something else that you're going to have to consider. There's the question of, I like to be extemporaneous, and online work tends not to be. A lot of preparation ahead of time. And because it's front-end loaded and you're paying for it, then those courses are not liable to be changed very easily. So if that's going to be a value that your people want, you've got to build it into the kind of design that you do. Students have expectations for more than just classrooms. They're expecting they can get their library books. They're expecting they could register this way. Most of us have moved online, but not always off campus. So that's another question. So those would just be some of the things that I would be thinking in that immediate part around those people who are actually going to be involved in the activity itself. At the back end, it affects everything from uh, if you begin at a certain time in the year and you want to have classes in the way that you would in a residential campus, you have a very short period of time when students are allowed to drop a course. In real life, people with work demands and kids going to school often need another couple of weeks attached to it before that can happen. So you have to argue with the registrar about why these deadlines are not deadlines for your people. And so it goes on and on. So there are quite a number of those, and you need to talk to other people. You need to get a really good sense, as much as you can, of being able to say to people, this is what it looks like. Because if you just depend on those early leaders, then as soon as they figure they've done this and they're on to the next thing, because that's what they do, who's, go who's going to follow through? Who's going to keep up the contact with the students? Is this an add-on to somebody else's work? And we know so often that five years is five years, and what comes goes. So if you are going to invest in it, you really have to do your homework ahead of time. Do they need to know how distance learning works? Do university leaders in organizations mm -hmm. that maybe haven't had a distance learning provision in the past. Do these new, new provisions, do the leaders have to know how distance learning works? Fundamentally, yes, for a whole variety of things that we've talked about, but let me reiterate for you. Um, this is not just an add-on. This is not just an other method of teaching. You certainly can do blended learning. You can have opportunities where classrooms have part of their time online for various activities, but the major function is coming into the classroom. You can have activities where they're, it's, it's minimal in terms of the work that they do, but those kinds of blended or hybrid classes still work within the fundamental structure of the institution, and they work well. They can. They're fine, but to me they're not distance ed because distance ed is a full system. You can offer distance learning classes, it's not the same thing as doing distance education. And if you want to do distance education, you have to understand you're adding a fundamentally different system to the way you presently work and that they will run up against each other like I identified in some of the earlier answers. So you need to know what exactly does this look like? And it's why I said direct and indirect costs, because this is a front-end loaded way of dealing with things. So it means you have quite a sizable outlay as you're going forward. And you need to be able to see in the long term whether or not it's scalable. Because if it's not scalable, then do your business cars. Start there and finish there. Uh, learning and knowing what it looks like in other institutions is important for you as well as for your faculty. Finally, Margaret, do you think that university leaders make a difference? Well, there's an easy answer. Let's look at where there is no leadership and one certainly sees a difference. You see uncertainty, you see um, poor practices developing, you see factions, you see a whole series of 
behaviors that indicate that people are not feeling that there is a sense of where the or a purpose of where the organization is going. People want to be led in a sense of leadership being helping people to understand what's important to them and identifying a way of finding language to help put that into a strategic initiative that they can understand and, and work towards and believe in. And then they need to feel that whatever work they do is part of making that happen. So if that doesn't happen, if they have a sense that the leader is uncertain or isn't talking about things that are important to them, then a whole series of unenthusiastic things happen because the enthusiasm and the passion is really what you're picking up from the leader. You're picking up about a value system that in turn should be embodied by the people in the organization. It's one of the things I love about AU is that when you go there and you ask people, what's our mission? They will tell you, reducing barriers and increasing student success, everybody in the organization. And it's seldom you find a university where everybody talks about that. I have really appreciated hearing you giving us the benefit mm -hmm. of your insight and your knowledge. Thank you very much. Well, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.